Hi, and uh, welcome to this installment of Frank and Mary here in Westboro. If you haven't seen this show before, you know, my name is Art Bergeron. Uh, my day job is as an elder law attorney at Myrick O'Connell, actually right here in Westboro. But this is not about my day job. It's about my friends, Frank and Mary, whom you've probably seen if you've seen any of my presentations uh, at the at the local library or senior center. It, it, basically, it's very simple. Frank and Mary's goal in life is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And if you're like them, um, and you can identify with them, then you may want to see this show because the goal of the show is to allow you, like Frank and Mary, to know the programs you need to know about and the people you need to know about if you want to stay right here in Westboro for the rest of your life. So my co-host, Shelby Marshall, like everybody knows, and she's the person who inevitably finds these great guests. You know, I don't know how she does it. I think they all come to her selectmen's meetings. I don't know. But I don't know how she meets them all to talk about a whole variety of issues that might be of interest to you. Um, we had this guest back before, but I was I was telling him his reviews were so good that we decided to bring him back again. So Shelby, whom do we have today? Yeah, well, good morning, Arthur. Always great to see you. Welcome to our um, guest out in uh, viewer land. And I'm so excited that we have Sherrod Mehta back today to uh, be our guest. Um, he previously uh, spoke to us about our uh, a plastics recycling initiative going on here in Westboro. And um, Sherrod and I share a common bond through uh, the Rotary Club of Westboro. And um, Sherrod has offered to um, do some presentations on Frank and Mary about the environment and uh, kind of what we need to know. And this is the first of one of those series, uh, first of the series, excuse me. Um, and so because he's got lots to share with us, I'm going to welcome him and have him um, share his screen because I know we have a presentation that he's going to walk us through. Great. Thank you, Shelby. And good morning, Arthur. Welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, so I am going to share my screen. All right, well, so I'll just get started right away. So this is the environment series. Uh, this is part one of four. I will go through this topic of climate change and greenhouse gases today. And toward the end, uh, uh, I'll explain the what the rest, rest of the parts are about. So just as a disclaimer, this is a provided as a social service. I am not representing any organization or enterprise. This is strictly a volunteered uh, presentation. Now, you've all heard about terms like uh, climate change, global warming, and so on. And they all allude to, you know, bad things happening uh, in the near future, like rising sea levels and heat waves and uh, uh, droughts and, and so on and so forth. And then you get this uh, uh, a kicker which says if the temperature of the earth goes up by more than one and a half degrees C, basically the sky is going to fall <laughs> and all sorts of you know bad things will happen. And, and I'm hearing all this and looking at this and saying, you know, we live in New England and temperature changes by one and a half degrees in one and a half minutes here. So what is this? <laughs> and Someone from the science class will admonish that, you know, climate is not the same as weather and you're conflating between the two. And I don't like the word conflate. So I decided to dig a little deeper and in the next few minutes, I would like to share uh, my understanding of the uh, environmental issue. So, What's really happening is we live on this planet Earth and most, uh, almost all of our energy uh, comes from the sun through radiation from space. Uh, and we receive energy from the sun uh, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's constantly uh, being showered upon the Earth. And we um, uh, have a stable, uh, conditions on the earth, which means uh, because as in physics, uh, energy cannot be 
uh, created or destroyed. If you're getting energy in, there must be a way the energy is going out. And somehow this balance is being maintained, which is why we are able to live on this planet Earth. And someone or scientists actually um, did like a bookkeeping exercise. And this is a nice little chart that shows it. So we get most, if not all of our sun uh, energy from the solar, uh, uh, from the sun. And this is where it goes. So uh, let's say uh, about 30% of it gets reflected right back from the atmosphere. And some of it gets absorbed in other places and about half of it reaches the land and the oceans. And it gets absorbed and then it gets uh, transmitted back out. So how does that happen? Well, the earth has, you know, if you've seen pictures of the earth from the moon and such, uh, there is this uh, glow and as a matter of fact, most of this radiation going out uh, happens in the infrared, which we can't see. But it is happening, and the proof of that is we're all sitting here uh, in, a, in a relatively safe, uh, uh, stable place. Uh, so the energy is being balanced. Now, off late in the last 50, 70 years, there is a change in this uh, balance uh, that has existed for the last you know, millions of years. And the change is that the temperature of the earth is slowly rising. When I say temperature, I mean the average temperature of the earth, which means that somehow we are still getting the same amount of energy that we used to get, but the amount of energy that's going out is less. And so the, the uh, earth is storing some of the energy as a result of which the temperature is going up. Now, scientists looked at what was causing this, and one of the uh, uh, suspicions was that the amount of carbon dioxide is the temperature rise associated with the carbon dioxide concentration uh, in the atmosphere uh, globally. Now, this is an interesting chart of the historical data. What it shows is for the last 400,000 years, the uh, red line here shows the variation in carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. And it goes up and down and more or less balances on an average. But interestingly, the upper orange line actually shows the temperature variation, the average temperature variation uh, during the same time. And you see that they are, uh, the two lines are tracking each other, which means that as the carbon dioxide Concentration goes up, the temperature uh, also rises, and when it goes down, the temperature also falls. Now, as I said earlier, in the last 50, 70 years, there is a trend where we are noticing that the amount of carbon dioxide is increasing at an alarmingly rapid pace, which means that if all this is true, uh, the temperature of the Earth is also likely to uh, rise at a very rapid scale. Well, so what's why... interesting, Sharad, if I may just, um, sure. what's interesting is the, it, it looks that like the percent of rise in CO2 um, is inflated when you look at it from a comparison in the temperature. So when you look at sort of the peaks, um, yes. you get a much greater temperature rise um, than you do relative to the CO2 levels. That, uh, which that's a great makes, point. It right. makes it even more concerning, yeah. Right, because you know, carbon dioxide is very good at absorbing uh, energy from the sun, and it absorbs the energy and its temperature rises, and that's what causes this uh, larger change in the, in the temperature. So that's a, that's a really good observation. Thank you, Shelby. Uh, so now the, uh, uh, what this is showing, this is another chart, what it's showing is, um, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, emitted in the atmosphere, from 1750 onwards on to recent times. And you can see that it was a really uh, small uh, number until we reach the 1900s. This is when automobiles yep. uh, started to run. 
And around 1950, it was rising slowly. And you can see that as the number of cars and vehicles started to grow worldwide, this carbon dioxide emission, uh, emission basically skyrocketed. And that corresponds to this uh, portion of the uh, rise in, in carbon dioxide concentration. So now, why do we worry about this? Well, so the temperature is rising. What's, what could happen? This is, it, uh, this is really showing um, the uh, permafrost. The effect of rising temperature on the permafrost is what the concern is. And I'm going to explain that in, in, uh, in this chart. So suppose you were, this is uh, on my left, you see a picture of the, uh, of the globe of the earth. And let's say you were sitting on a satellite and you were uh, stationed right above the North Pole and looking down, and this is what the Earth would look like as a map. And you would see portions of Canada, portions of Russia, and this purple area here is actually the region. It's a pretty large land area, and it's called the permafrost region. And it's called by that name because this, uh, this area of land is permanently frozen and it has a large amount of carbon dioxide stored in it. Uh, this is from the over, over mil millions of years, the uh, vegetation and the animals that lived there uh, died and then their bodies uh, decayed and sent off carbon dioxide, which, uh, which actually was uh, trapped in this uh, uh, frosted, uh, permafrost area. Now, the concern is that as the temperature starts to rise and during the summer, the temperature could rise enough that this permafrost would start to melt. And if that happens, this carbon dioxide that is uh, trapped in, these, in this landmass would actually start to uh, release itself. And once that happens, it would the amount of carbon dioxide that would be released would be much, much more than the uh, fossil fuel carbon dioxide that we produce. Now, this would set off a chain reaction. What would happen is the carbon dioxide would absorb more heat from the sun and the temperature of the atmosphere would rise and that would melt more of the permafrost. And so we would have this cycle um, uh, take off and that would be now impossible to control. And whether at that point we stop using uh, uh, fossil fuels or not, it wouldn't matter because we have set off a chain reaction, which is now uh, not possible to stop. Mm. So now, and there is this, uh, you will hear things like the one and a half degrees temperature rise and uh, the year 2050 as uh, a tipping point. So what, what that's about is that by the year 2050, if we stay on the course that we are on right now and don't change anything, the temperature would rise to the point where this uh, chain reaction would start. And so the world over, um, what, what human, uh, beings are really trying to do is to uh, prevent this from happening and a, a lot of activities are going on worldwide to be able to uh, address this issue. Um, so <laughs> that's that's the problem that uh, uh, that that is that is the tipping point. That is that emoji is exactly how I'm feeling during the presentation. <laughs> I was going to say. So is there a happy ending coming here? For, for, I'm not seeing a happy ending. This is, well, this is sad. Stay tuned, Arthur. Right. <laughs> um, and it comes right back to us. So. Mm. Uh, it, well, it's, it's fascinating it's, when you look at that timeline in the countries and you think about, you know, the things that we take pride in, right? Industrialization right. and innovation and globalization and all the other Asians, right? Um, you look at this and you go, you know, we've sort of, we've been our own worst enemy. Um, right. And so how do we... How do we continue to have all of those Asians without, you know, but yet um, 
uh, you know, stopping stopping the thaw, you know, stopping right. or, or what whatever we're contributing right. so that right. we don't get to the tipping point. Right. All right. So let me go on. Uh, so what's happening is just a little bit uh, of what, uh, why are we concerned about the uh, rise in temperature? Now, as we know, uh, the cloud, we get rain from the clouds and the clouds are formed in the oceans and they, they uh, lift the moisture and winds drive the clouds to land and they uh, drop the moisture off and that becomes rain. Now, if the temp as the temperature rises, remember three quarters of the earth is covered in water. So more, a lot more moisture will be lifted up from the oceans and brought to land. And so we will see increase in flooding and changes in wind patterns, which would cause more hurricanes. And so that's as far as what's happening in the oceans and the water bodies. Now, what about deserts? Well, deserts are already dry. So as the temperature rises, they will lose more moisture than they already do. And so that's going to lead to droughts and forest fires. And we already see effects of these. So in both areas, we stand to lose at the rise of temperature uh, and uh, it, it, because it's on such a large scale, small change of temperature has a really big effect. So we will be seeing, the, uh, the other piece that I, I do want to mention is that this, this chain reaction that uh, we had just uh, looked at earlier, what it causes is an instability. So the weather conditions, the cold will become colder or hot will become hotter and it'll keep increasing uh, the, the range of it, the, the highs and the lows will keep increasing from uh, year to year or time to time. And so that's, that's what is typically called an unstable uh, condition. And that's the other, other uh, phenomenon that uh, uh, we are afraid of. So now, we, we've all seen pictures like this on TV and such. The, there's flooding where there's, uh, you know, cities and populations uh, uh, settled. Uh, there's the hurricanes. We've seen Katrina and we've seen Puerto Rico's uh, disaster. And we've seen forest fires this summer we saw in California. This was all... Um, uh, it's a few millions of acres and they were much more than last year's or the year before, and, and the, the devastation is, is, is larger. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like, um, you know, we're on that trend, and this is a drought uh, scene. So obviously there's a dam here, so there must be a water catchment area here where there's no water. So this, this in my, as, a, as an, uh, is an eye catcher for me for representing a drought. So these are the, the, the scenarios uh, that would result as, as the uh, temperature rises that uh, uh, we're all concerned about. So now comes, uh, you know, our, our uh, question on what can we do? And I'm gonna take just a couple of slides to describe that. Well, first we look at what are the sources of the greenhouse gas emissions? And this is for US as a, uh, as a whole. And broadly speaking, you know, a third of the uh, greenhouse gases come from uh, transportation, from the vehicles we drive, the trucks and the, and the cars and such. Uh, about 28% comes from uh, electricity generation. This is the uh, natural gas and oil and coal and, and all these other sources. And the rest of it comes from these, uh, uh, these other uh, sources. Now, we did uh, an analysis as part of our uh, Climate Action Plan Task Force um, that I'm a member of. And we looked at what are the greenhouse gas sources in the town of Westboro. And Westboro produces about a quarter of a million metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. And it's broadly, um, the, there are three major sources of these, uh, uh, of this, these uh, CO2 emissions. 
One is transportation. Uh, that accounts for about a third of it. Uh, the second is um, uh, building heating. Uh, this is the uh, oil furnaces and uh, all of the, the wood pellets and, and uh, all these other sources, uh, fossil fuels that we use for to heat our homes. These are all sort of essential needs. Uh, they're not uh, luxury items. And then we have electricity where we, uh, the electricity, uh, as I mentioned, was is produced um, uh, by, a, a, a lot of it is produced by burning fossil fuels. So if we take these three sectors, it actually accounts for 83% of the total greenhouse gas emissions that are produced in our town. And Sherrod, is this is this just so we're all clear? Is this both residential and commercial? Yes. 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 Okay. This is for the total. Yep. Okay. Thanks. This is for the total. Yes. So now we come to Arthur's question. We understand all this. So what can we do? And so the what I'm uh, the point I'm going to make here is that there are technologies and solutions. Uh, at an economical scale that exists today that we can apply uh, to address these issues. And um, it would be a good time for us to take a look at these technologies and the economics and understand it. So when we get a chance to switch, for example, if you're changing our vehicle or we're changing our heating system and so on, we can actually take an informed decision uh, and and make the switch to be able to address this uh, because it really has to be done on a you know individual by individual family by family uh, small business by small business uh, uh, and grow on to a, a global scale. So the technologies that I uh, uh, exist so far. Um, uh, for transportation, uh, there are electric vehicles that are available, and I am going to uh, give one one part of my uh, series here is about electric vehicles, and we're going to look into the technology and the uh, economics of it and see where and how it would make sense for uh, an individual or a household uh, to be able to make sense to be able to make the switch. The second is uh, electricity. And here, one option that's available to us is the uh, uh, solar panels on rooftops. Uh, so wherever possible, we will look at the uh, technology of the solar panels and the uh, uh, economics of it. And so, but remember, solar panels are not the only choice. We also have the uh, clean power choice that's offered by the town. And it has uh, various levels. Okay. And we, we, it, we can look at the uh, relative costs of uh, the uh, higher um, renewable energy content so uh, whether it's 40 percent or 80 percent and how much do they how much is the change in cost if we go with the uh, the higher ones versus the lower ones and does it make economical sense for us to make the switch and then lastly as far as uh, heating is concerned there are these things called uh, heat pumps which are uh, very efficient new pieces of technology that can replace fossil fuels. And if we are able to make these three uh, trans transitions to these three technologies, then we will be able to get up to 85% of the greenhouse gases emitted within our town itself. Uh, and of course, it's for, uh, we, we are um, typical of similar towns around us. And so similar, uh, principles would apply there as well. Uh, and so if all of us do this uh, on, on a very careful, organized way, uh, then we, we can actually have an effect on the, uh, on the reduction of greenhouse gases and uh, you know, protecting the environment going forward. 
That's terrific. And, that's that's uh, just terrific. I'm sorry. So, <clears throat> Go ahead. I just wanted. This is my. This is where I wanted to end. I, I really like this quote. Uh, it says, uh, "We we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children, and so it's our responsibility to uh, take care of it in a responsible way. And of course, when we give it to our children, our children would have borrowed it from their children, mm -hmm. so they will have to take care of it uh, in their own time mm -hmm. when they take important decisions like these." Uh, and so the process would go on uh, from generation to generation. This is just terrific. And I, and I know, once again, as, as, you, as you know, Shard, my, one of my jobs here is to be timekeeper. So I'm kind of watching the time and saying we're right. a little close. Um, but I think the notion of really having this looked at at the community level, right. is, which is, is what makes it so much this so much fun. Right. Because, right. because they're not individual decisions. If you're doing it as a the community is really committed to it. You right. really are making a huge difference. Right. Huge. Right. Well, but, I, you know, I, every family has to decide for themselves. So it is a, it is a, a financial choice that has to be made and carefully considered. So yes, the yeah, information and, is important. And I and I do want to point out that um, you know I, I think you know it, it can feel certainly like a little bit of a doomsday start to the conversation, but um, I. I appreciate, Sharad, that you brought forward a couple of things. One is there is a climate action plan um, being developed. It's almost ready for sort of prime time and being presented to the town right. as to what the next, you know, 30 years will look like here in Westport. How do we address these things, not only from a town perspective on the municipal level, but the uh, changes that we can make that would influence both residential and commercial uh, behaviors, if you will, and purchases. Um, so very excited to see that coming forward. There's a lot of there are a lot of other things already in place, right? Westboro Power Choice, Sherrod already mentioned. So you can make a choice um, for, or at least you can understand the cost of making the choice for 100% uh, clean local energy right, right now. Um, and and there's a calculator online through our website. Um, again, our friend Aiden will put up the slide screen that says if you have any questions, Sherrod's email was also on here, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to show you how to navigate to that website. So um, we've got a lot going on here in Westboro where uh, two, town, uh, there, two police vehicles are proposed to be purchased um, on our town uh, meeting warrant, and those are proposed to be hybrid vehicles. So we need to keep pressing and insisting upon, um, you know, those type of purchases um, uh, because it it makes good financial sense, and it makes you know we don't have any of this. <laughs> None of this kind of matters if it's if you know we're dealing with famine and flooding and everything else. Um, so uh, we've got to you know now is the time we can't wait. Good. That's a great summary. Now is the time we can't wait, but we are going to have to wait <laughs> the next show so we can talk a little <laughs> bit more about what we can do. It's great that you're going to be on, Sherrod. This will be right. a lot of fun. Uh, you know, Shelby was all excited when she talked about really doing this as a series. Yeah. And, and once again, I think, you know, by the end of this, you're going to be ready, ready to run for a selectman. I mean, you're going to have some <laughs> name recognition here. It's going to be terrific. So thank you very much, Sherrod, for coming on. Shelby, thanks for suggesting this series. Folks, I hope you enjoyed this. You know, the doomsday is not. And once again, we're doing this for our kids and our grandchildren, right? We're going to be dead before this doomsday, but they're going to be around to try to have to deal with it, right? So thank you very much for watching. We will look forward to seeing you on the next installment of Frank and Mary here in Westboro, and next month we'll, we'll, we'll invite Sherrod back for his next installment. Thank you very much. <laughs>